Thank you. The next item of business is a statement by Angus Robertson on retained EU law. The Cabinet Secretary will take questions at the end of his statement, and so there should be no interventions or interruptions. I call on Angus Robertson, Cabinet Secretary. Up to 10 minutes, please. Thank you very much, Presiding uh, Officer. I wish to make a statement on the UK Government's so-called Brexit Freedoms Bill, which will have a profound and sadly a damaging impact on this Parliament and on Scotland as a whole. People of Scotland, of course, rejected Brexit by a margin of 24 per cent, and there was a majority for remaining in the EU in every single local authority area in Scotland. Nevertheless, in February this year, the UK Government published a document extolling what they called the benefits of Brexit. At the time, I noted to members of the Constitution, Europe and External Affairs Committee the profound absence of Brexit benefits for people and for businesses in Scotland. Indeed, the disbenefits were all too evident. Polling shows that 75% of people in Scotland have a negative opinion about whether the UK has benefited from Brexit, and only 2% believe that Boris Johnson has delivered a good deal. Five months on, and with the Brexit Freedoms Bill potentially imminent, we find ourselves in an even more desperate situation. We are in the midst of a cost-of-living crisis. The think tank UK in a Changing Europe says Brexit has led to a 6% increase in food prices. The Centre for European Reform reports that the UK economy was 5% or £31 billion smaller than comparator economies at the end of last year, primarily because of Brexit. Scotland's total trade with the EU was 16 per cent lower in 2021 than in 2019, with food exports down by £68 million. And now, with the UK in real danger of entering recession and in the middle of this cost of living crisis, the Tory government at Westminster seems intent on provoking a trade war with the European Union by tearing up an international agreement that the Prime Minister himself hailed as a fantastic moment. So despite much searching by the UK Government's so-called Minister for Brexit Opportunities, the only thing to have changed since February is that the disbenefits of Brexit are now more pronounced. And whilst Mr Rees-Mogg has been on his feet this afternoon in the House of Commons, hopefully providing the clarity we haven't yet received, the UK Government has declined to share the Brexit Freedoms Bill instructions with us or provide any settled certainty of its policy intentions. Regardless, we should be under no illusions about the risk this legislation presents to Scotland. We understand that the bill will end the supremacy of European law and repeal or reform regulations on business. The danger of a hard Brexit inspired race to the bottom is now greater than ever. Beneath the froth of crown marking on pint glasses and the adoption of imperial weights and measures, the UK Government's intention to turn away from EU laws should trigger real concern for businesses for members of this Parliament and all those who hold dear the standards the EU has helped to embed in our society. Over 2,000 pieces of legislation, 2,000 pieces of legislation, carefully influenced, possibly even proposed by the UK Government as a member state over 50 years of EU membership, must be made to go through a legislative process or, according to media reports, will simply sunset and fall away from the statute book entirely. There is no understanding in Whitehall about how much of that legislation falls within devolved competence. I have had a look at Jacob Rees-Mogg's statement. He makes no mention whatsoever about the devolved consequences of his announcement. And there is no desire to understand the consequent implications for devolved powers or legislation. Apparently, these changes are to be done by 2026 or 2030, dates whose sole rationale is that it makes good PR as an anniversary of the Brexit referendum or the end of the transition period, not driven by the magnitude or importance of the task, not driven by the availability of time in this Parliament or that of the Senate or Stormont or indeed of Westminster and taking no account of the fact that there is no executive in place in Northern Ireland as a direct consequence of the hard Brexit the UK Government has chosen to prosecute. Instead, yet again, the bill is driven by the same blind ideology that caused so much damage to Scotland in the first place. The truth of the matter is, Presiding Officer, that the pace of this exercise threatens parliamentary scrutiny and parliamentary workloads. The UK Government is tilting at the windmills of EU standards 
when it would be better advised to cease undermining the Northern Ireland Protocol, an action which blocks implementation of the Trade and Cooperation Agreement and causes our continued exclusion, for example, from the Horizon Europe Research Programme. There is little to no appropriate consideration of the impact of this Bill, intended or otherwise, of doing away with the regulations and case law that have driven the high standards across Europe and from which we benefit. The UK Government has said it wants the Brexit Freedoms Bill to, and I quote, utilise regulatory freedoms by, I again quote, lightening their burden on UK business. Its main purpose appears to be to give the UK Government the freedom to abandon the legislation that has protected Scottish interests for almost 50 years. This bill will create uncertainty for business and threatens to fire the starting pistol in a race to the bottom in standards on food, the environment, animal and plant health and workers' rights. This is a threat to devolution, taken alongside the powers of the Internal Market Act Devolved competencies will be disastrously exposed and undermined by a UK government searching for an answer to the self-inflicted pain of Brexit. Our policy of aligning with EU standards will be at risk. The Common Frameworks process, which is designed to manage divergence and alignment, looks to be sidestepped or ignored completely. Sensible standards and regulations will only be kept if they are re-enacted through this Parliament and then only temporarily protected if the Internal Market Act is directed to undercut them. We do not yet know the exact implications for the legislative programme for this Parliament, as we have not been provided with the necessary detail. But we do know that if we want to maintain the legislation, we will have to find a great amount of government and a great amount of parliamentary time. When I met the Minister for so-called Brexit opportunities, I was assured by him that the Sewell Convention would be respected. If that commitment is to be honoured, it would mark a departure from the UK Government's approach during the Brexit process when it has repeatedly legislated on devolved matters despite this Parliament refusing its consent to do so. An approach that sunsets EU law, which would see legislation automatically fall if unamended by a fixed deadline, takes no account of our priorities or our interest in keeping aligned with EU legislation. It is unacceptable that the UK Government seems ready to unveil sweeping measures that could have profound consequences for Scotland with such little discussion or indeed respect for Parliament, the Scottish Government or indeed the people of Scotland. This makes a mockery of the UK Government's recent commitments to reset relationships with the devolved governments. I said at the beginning that the Minister of so-called Brexit Opportunities has been searching for the benefits of Brexit since at least February. This has included the attempt to crowdsource ideas from the public via the media, presumably in the absence of suggestions from Whitehall departments. Presiding officer, the disaster of Brexit is becoming ever more apparent, and the attack on this Parliament by a UK Government that was comprehensively rejected by the people of Scotland is gathering pace. The question for all of us here is whether we are prepared to put up with this unfolding catastrophe which is being imposed against the wishes and interests of Scotland, or whether we say enough is enough and forge a better future for everyone who lives here. Thank you. The Cabinet Secretary will now take questions on the issues raised in his statement. I intend to allow around 20 minutes for questions, after which we will move on to the next item of business. It would be helpful if those members who wish to ask a question were to press the request to speak button. So I call Donald Cameron. Uh, Deputy Presiding Officer, I have sat through many uh, ministerial statements, uh, many full of details and statistics, many with policy announcements, many with something as an opposition MSP to get one's teeth into. But never have I sat through a statement so thin, so devoid of detail, so empty of substance as this one. No new information has been imparted today. It is essentially one long complaint about Brexit, and that's it. There is no UK bill. It hasn't been published yet. The Cabinet Secretary has no idea what it contains. He does know that discussions between devolved governments and Cabinet officials are ongoing, and it is at the discretion of devolved governments to decide how they deal with retained EU law that is devolved. But maybe the Scottish Government might just, might just have waited for the UK Government to set out its position publish the legislation 
and then come to the chamber with the Scottish Government's response properly researched, argued and underpinned by the facts. Let me ask him this. He speculates that the bill will create uncertainty for business. Does he agree that what is really creating uncertainty for business and for people across Scotland is his government's own blind ideology, to use his phrase, their obsession with independence and another divisive polarising referendum? Yeah. <laughs> um, I disagree with much of uh, what the Conservative um, spokesman has said on uh, this issue, but I can, I can agree with them on, on one thing. The sharing of information by the UK Government on a measure which will have a profound impact on this Parliament and how it's able, how its ability to, be, uh, uh, to um, deal with business has been profound. And just one illustration of that. I've, I've had one meeting with Jacob Rees-Mogg on this subject. He travelled all the way to Edinburgh. He asked to meet me and then couldn't be bothered to make the last 200 metres of the journey to come to Scottish Government office buildings to discuss what was being planned, and he couldn't even tell me how many of the laws that he was planning to, as the media has reported, sunset by some arbitrary deadline will impact on the devolved settlement. And in that respect, Donald Cameron is absolutely right. The amount of information that has been shared with the Scottish Government has been woeful. It follows an all too familiar pattern from this UK Government, little to no detail on proposed legislation beyond what could be gleaned from the media broad assurances that devolution will be respected, with nothing on how that will be ensured, performative engagement rather than a genuine attempt to engage on policy substance, or a willingness to adjust proposals to reflect the Scottish Government's concerns. I would have thought that should concern every member of, the member of this Parliament in all parties. It's disappointing. It's not to be found on the Conservative benches. I would remind all members who wish to ask a question to please check that they have pressed the request to speak button. I call Sarah Boyack. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Can I also thank the Cabinet Secretary for advance uh, notice of his statement. I am equally disappointed at the ideology behind Brexit and the thoughtless and dishonesty from the UK Government, the Tory Government, on its impact on people in Scotland and right across the UK. Um, we do need to protect the Sewell Convention and to protect our devolutional settlement. And there is an, I an irony that we have two governments promoting their ideologies and seeking to divert from their failures and the lack of support for our constituents who are experiencing a massive cost of living crisis. Scottish Labour supports aligning with our EU neighbours, protecting our labour, consumer and environmental standards and enabling trade with our neighbours. Points we made in the recent debates on the Continuity Act and the Internal Market Act Cabinet Secretary, as you have admitted, the statement is light on content and, as you say, there will be hard work to ensure that we do everything we can to protect our constituents and businesses from the damage and uncertainty created by Brexit. So can I ask the Cabinet Secretary what he is doing now to identify how he uses our Parliament's devolved powers to the max to protect labour standards, incentivise our businesses to produce products that protect consumer rights, that meet standards of health and safety, and to deliver the environmental standards that we need. Because although it will in involve a huge amount of work, as the uh, Constitution Committee acknowledged, we need to monitor and track both at the EU level, and now it appears at the UK level, what is happening in terms of alignment with the EU. So these are the practical things I would like to hear from the Cabinet Secretary in terms of his action plan. Cabinet Secretary. Well, can I thank Sir Boric for her questions and the positive way in which she has put them uh, this afternoon. I, I welcome the commitment from the Labour Party uh, to wish to seek to protect the Sewell Convention and to protect standards. Um, and I think Sir Boric is absolutely right uh, that we look at all means at our disposal to be able to protect these uh, safeguards. Um, she will understand that given the paucity of information that we've had from the UK Government, save uh, for the, um, uh, the mention of the quantum of the legislation uh, that is being envisaged at over 2,000. Uh, let's say, for sake of argument, this Parliament agrees uh, that it will decline to give legislative consent 
uh, for this UK government measure. Unfortunately, our experience thus far in the Brexit context is that UK governments override the Sewell Convention, uh, in which case we will have to use a lot of parliamentary time to find out ways of being able to um, protect and maintain the safeguards that have existed through European Union legislation. We are right at the beginning of that uh, process, but I say, I say to Sarah Boric, she is absolutely right to highlight that this is the key challenge for, for all of us. We have been trying to find our way through, together with colleagues in the committee, about how we have been able to do that thus far in terms of remaining aligned with the European Union. This is of an order of magnitude far beyond that. Uh, and there is a lot of work that is going to have to go into that. And I look forward to working across the Chamber uh, to make sure that we can use all the powers at our disposal, as a Parliament and as Government, to make sure that we can retain the benefits and that the safeguards that have been legislated for in a European Union context uh, can be protected. I call Christine Graham to follow by Sharon Dowie. Uh, thank you very much, Presiding Officer. The Cabinet Secretary refers in his statement on this uh, bill impacting on devolved issues, but of course without any prior discussion, but seeking, and I quote from the UK Government, to lighten the burden, close quotes, on businesses. Does the Cabinet Secretary share my concerns that this translates into undermining workers' rights and protections? And as employment law is not devolved, how can this Parliament ensure that these remain protected? Cabinet Secretary. Well, Christine Graham, I think, is absolutely right to home in on the specifics of different aspects of European Union law that we have enjoyed and we value as a society. And we have the European Union to thank for some of our most cherished employment rights, including basic fundamentals like written terms and conditions uh, and equal pay. Those rights are now at risk as a consequence of the UK Government's reckless drive to heap yet more misery on millions of working families across this country and creating the conditions for our citizens to secure safe, fairly paid work is not red tape. It is an essential requirement of every responsible uh, government. Of course, we simply do not know at this stage what the UK Government intends to do with employment rights in future, as they, as they have not told us and clearly have not told the Conservative front bench in this Parliament either. We do know, however, that the Minister for Brexit Opportunities, or I should always take the opportunity to say so-called Brexit opportunities, has said today that he may wish to retain only dozens of 2,400 laws it has identified. So there is, of course, a very real risk that protections for workers may be undermined by the powers provided to UK ministers through the Brexit Freedoms Bill. I call Sharon Dowry to be followed by Ruth McGuire. Thank you, Presiding Officer. When it comes to gene editing, the SNP have shown that they are perfectly capable of diverging from the UK standard and potentially the future EU standard, unnecessarily and unfairly punishing Scotland's farmers for no good reason. Even their own former Chief Scientific Advisor agrees. So will the Cabinet Secretary agree that he should have a serious rethink of the situation and stop holding back Scotland's farmers? Well, uh, Presiding Officer, frankly, that has absolutely nothing to do with the statement um, that I have just given uh, to Parliament, so I am sure I would be rebuked for being going, going down highways and byways that have nothing to do Cabinet with this. I think if you extract the kind of general point being made and respond to that, and perhaps briefly, that would be... Well, the general point is that the question that has been asked has got absolutely nothing to do with the bill that has been proposed by the UK Government today. Well, it's up to the chair really to determine that, Cabinet Secretary, and I had felt that in broad brush something could be extracted, but I think the Cabinet Secretary has responded to the member in the way that he considers appropriate. We'll now call Ruth McGuire, who's joining us remotely, to be followed by Katie Clark. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Brexit freedoms, getting Brexit done, levelling up. Does the Cabinet Secretary feel the same frustrations as many of my constituents at the UK Government's list of empty post-Brexit slogans? And is the Scottish Government dismayed, as I am, by the potential damage that will be done by such heavy-handed, deeping legislation, despite its light title? Cabinet Secretary. So, yes and yes, Presiding uh, Officer, that the, the title given to this bill would be laughable if its potential impact were not so uh, deadly serious. The only freedom on offer here is that of being worse off, more polluted, less safe as a consumer, customer or employee. And while all this untold damage has been inflicted at breakneck speed, all to meet an artificial PR-driven deadline, this Parliament will have no freedom whatsoever to pass the measures that your constituents and mine actively want to see. Frustration 
and dismay are just two of the many words, some more colourful, I'd use to describe our reaction. I call Casey Clark to be followed by Siobhan Brown. Thank you, Presiding Officer. The negative impact of Brexit on Scotland and indeed the whole of the UK is clear, as is the Conservative Government's failure to work with all of the devolved institutions. Can the Cabinet Secretary outline what he can do to ensure that legislation is brought before this Parliament on areas such as agricultural subsidies, where it is clear there is devolved responsibility as soon as possible? And can he outline what work is being done on how, for example, public procurement will be affected and what legislation this Parliament can enact? Well, can I thank Katie Clark for the positive way in which she has uh, asked the question again? I think it, 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 um, it, it mirrors the, um, the point that was uh, made uh, by her Labour frontbench uh, colleague. We are going to have to um, uh, ascertain which amongst the UK government's proposed list of 2,400, incidentally, apparently has gone up by 700 in the course of the last uh, week. Uh, pieces of legislation that may impact uh, or may not, depending on how the UK government uh, decides to treat the Seoul Convention. I should say, incidentally, if the UK government wanted to take devolution seriously, it could legislate and it could limit the scope of its legislation to England or to England and Wales uh, only, in which case retained legislation could remain on the statute uh, in Scotland. I give a commitment uh, to her and any of her colleagues who have a close interest in particular policy areas that we can discuss over the months ahead what needs to be done to protect safeguards, the most appropriate way of doing it, to protect the Parliament's ability to, um, uh, to better understand uh, the proposals that are, are being made, whilst at the same time having a conscious understanding of the scale of the potential uh, job at hand given uh, the way in which the UK government is planning to go forward with this measure. I call Siobhan Brown to be followed by Willie Rennie. Thank you, Presiding Officer. As the Scottish Government begins setting out the progressive, hopeful vision for a wealthier, happier, fairer Scotland in the European family of nations, the UK Government instead continues to drag the devolved countries through a regressive and damaging Brexit, epitomised by the disastrous proposal of the so-called Brexit Freedoms Bill. Does the Cabinet Secretary believe that now, more than ever, the people of Scotland must be given the democratic choice for which they have repeatedly voted for, a referendum on, on independence and a decision on Scotland's future? Cabinet Secretary. I think, well, yes, is, is the answer. And the, and the one lesson that can be safely drawn from this sorry episode is that for as long as uh, Scotland is misgoverned by Westminster, the UK Government will continue to inflict on the people of Scotland, the long-running psychodrama that is Brexit and its dire unfolding consequences. The real freedom we need to be talking about is for the people of Scotland to be free to make their own choice about the future of their own country. This bill will merely serve to make it more obvious which choice the people of Scotland should and will make. Willie Rennie to be followed by Jackie Dunbar. Yeah, Brexit is a disaster. The Tories are terrible at government, but none of that is new. And whilst it's always worth repeating in my mind, I'm not sure this statement of endless speculation moves us any further forward. Look, I, I support the keeping pace powers, but the lack of cooperation reflects badly on both governments. Both the Scottish and UK governments are responsible for this terrible relationship. So what steps is the Cabinet Secretary going to take to improve this relationship so he doesn't have to make another speculative statement to this Parliament. Cabinet Secretary. Well, firstly, let me identify the thing that we agree on. I think that's a, a good way to start. Um, uh, Willie Rennie said he supported keep pace powers. So I think what he's trying to say is that he supports the Scottish Government's position on safeguarding European legislation and, and retaining pace with those. I, if that's what he meant, I welcome that. Um, on uh, the equivalence in his questioning of uh, criticising the state of relations with the UK government uh, and the Scottish government, can I, can I say to him, there is no equivalence in this. In this, in this specific case, I've already informed Parliament and told him that when the Scottish government tried to have a conversation with the UK government and asked specific questions about it, the minister responsible was not even prepared to come and meet in person. So please, please don't, when being aware of the facts, when one is aware of the facts, 
please don't propagate a false equivalence. The Scottish Government has asked for the information, has not received the information. Has act There's no point shaking one's head. I'm, te I'm telling Parliament the facts. I asked the questions. I didn't receive the answers. I asked to meet the Minister in question. He wasn't prepared to do so. Those are the facts. And if Willie Rennie takes them to heart, he will end the false equivalence that he speaks about so often in this chamber. I have four more members who wish to ask a question, and in order to get all four in, I would appreciate uh, short and succinct questions and answers. I call Jackie Dunbar to be followed by Ross Creer. Retained EU law has been a buffer for Scotland against the damaging and far-reaching effects of a hard Tory Brexit. Now that the UK Government is seeking to sweep aside these safeguards, does the Cabinet Secretary believe that the Scottish Government's mm -hmm. firm commitment to continuity within European law will be undermined and made more difficult by this obsessive Brexit's Freedom Bill? Cabinet Secretary. Well, as members will be aware, this Parliament passed the Continuity Act with the express purpose of providing Scottish ministers the powers needed to ensure Scotland can keep pace with future developments in EU law where appropriate. These EU laws have set high standards, for example, uh, for our environment uh, and for air and water quality. They have upheld workers' rights and employment law. They have protected animal welfare, plant health and biosecurity. These are far from trivial matters. They are the very substance that underpins what we recognise as important to our society and our environment. So I very much hope Parliament can work together across the parties to do everything that we need to do to safeguard these safeguards in our public life, in our uh, national legislation, uh, and maintain the alignment that Scotland has had over the decades with the rest of the European Union in these important areas uh, of life. Call Ross Creer to be followed by Morris Golden. Thank you. Jacob Rees Mogg is so desperate to find a benefit of Brexit that he's outsourced his search to the Sun and the far right Daily Express. This is clearly intended to advance the Tories' decades long campaign for British workers to have the weakest rights and protections in Europe. Does the Cabinet Secretary agree, therefore, that with little prospect of workers' rights being devolved to the Scottish Parliament within the UK, the only way to protect those rights is through independence in the European Union? Cabinet Secretary. Well, Ross Greer, of course, is, is correct. Ultimately, the the only safeguard we have of being a part of the European Union's legislative framework is by being in the European Union. And that is exactly where uh, Scotland shall be. And that's exactly the choice that people uh, should be able to have, given that we uh, live in a democracy. In the meantime, we need to do everything that we can in this Parliament to make sure that we do not have the rug pulled from underneath us by taking safeguards off the uh, statute book, but also acting in a way which will deluge this parliament uh, by having to uh, uh, find a precious time uh, to be able to legislate, to be able to legislate to retain the safeguards, something clearly that Conservative members don't take particularly seriously. I call Morris Golden to be followed by Willie Coffey. Uh, thank you, Deputy President Officer. The Cabinet Secretary suggests a race to the bottom on the environment, but the opposite is true. The UK Government is actually going further than the EU on the environment, such as targeting a 68% reduction in emissions by 2030 versus just 55% for the EU, or ending sales of petrol and diesel cars by 2030, versus 2035 for the EU. Does the Cabinet Secretary recognise the actions of the UK Government simply do not match his rhetoric? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, no, I, no, I don't, but perhaps we can find some common ground in this question. Because if it's the case that the, the, um, that the member and his colleagues are happy to see EU standards as a minimum, then no doubt he and his colleagues will be happy to impress on the UK Government that they will respect the Sewell Convention and respect the decision that is made in this Parliament in relation to legislative consent. And if the UK Government then wants to go on and legislate for matters which are devolved, so not in terms of Scotland, take the praise for it. Why don't we work in partnership on that as a challenge and make the UK Government proceed for England and let the Scottish Parliament and the Scottish Government work on the standards based on the safeguards of European legislation that we agree should be retained. I look forward to that. Uh, 
excuse me, Lord, I get all this sedentary commentary. I call Willie Colley, uh, Coffee. Thank you. Thank you. In the lead up to the European Union referendum, Brexiteer Tories insisted they weren't seeking a race to the bottom on food, on environmental standards, and on workers' rights, despite all the evidence to the contrary. Now we are seeing undeniable proof of our standards and rights being eroded with dodgy trade deals and the UK internal market undoing decades of progress within the European single market, which is ten times bigger. Does the Cabinet Secretary believe that the UK Brexit Freedoms Bill, whenever it appears, will accelerate this politically motivated downward spiral in trade standards? Cabinet Secretary. Well, I think Willie Rennie has every reason to be uh, concerned. We warned during the passage of the Internal Market Act that it would open the door to lower standards across a range of areas where EU laws used to apply. We are already seeing this threat being played out in relation to trade deals and the threat of products entering the country that do not meet the EU's rules on, say, animal welfare or food standards. The Internal Market Act means there is little we can do to stop these goods entering Scotland, whatever the views of this Parliament or the people of Scotland. Thank you, Cabinet Secretary. That concludes the statement. And there will be a very short pause before we move on to the next item of business to allow front bench teams to change positions should they wish. Thank you.